sharp colours, daily objects, celebrities and 1960s New York. Andy Warhol is now one of the most well-known artists of all time and synonymous with the trailblazing era of the 20th century. He was born on August 6, 1928 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with his given name Andrew Warholer. As a child, Warhol suffered from Cheria minor disease and had to spend long periods at home. But that was also when he took drawing lessons from his mother, which marked his birth as an artist. After obtaining his Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in Pittsburgh in 1949, Warhol followed his dreams to New York, where he began a career as an illustrator at magazines. During the late 1950s, a new art movement out of Britain began to take hold of the US and Warhol became its pioneer. Pop art seamlessly broke the boundaries between high and low art. Its colourful and youthful vibe, that included items popular to mass culture like ads and comic books, challenged tradition through irony. As Warhol saw art as a product, anything used in daily life had potential to become art material. This approach led to major yet unusual works, such as Campbell's soup cans, green Coca-Cola bottles, and the portrait series of Marilyn Monroe. With his artistic expression and interest in celebrity culture, he also created unique portraits of personalities, including Elizabeth Taylor, Jackie Kennedy, and Chinese leader Mao Zedong. Warhol's paintings have always been popular and highly valuable for auctioneers and art collectors. Most of his major works have set the bar high, with record prices at auctions. His silver car crash fetched $105 million in November 2013, followed by eight Elvises, which went for $100 million, and Turquoise Marilyn sold for $80 million. Seven years after his death, on February 22, 1987, the Andy Warhol Museum opened in his native Pittsburgh. With a permanent collection of 900 paintings, 100 sculptures and 4,000 photographs, it remains the largest museum in the US dedicated to a single artist. To speak more about the legendary pop artist, I am joined by Jean Wainwright. She is an internationally recognized expert on Andy Warhol, who over the last 20 years has had special access to Warhol's family and personal archives. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jean. Now, walk me a bit through his childhood and how he took steps into becoming the trademark name uh, in the art and entertainment industry. Andy Warhol's particularly fascinating because of his childhood. So he was brought up in a working class family in Pittsburgh. His parents were immigrants. His mother had come to Pittsburgh in 1921 and Warhol, of course, was born on, in 1928, in fact. So what was it that, that drove him, this, this boy who in their first house looked down on this extraordinary city full of industry and smelting and pollution and yet became this phenomenon? There are various things. One, he had tremendous support from his mother. She recognised his talent and encouraged him in his drawing, but also actually encouraged him in his competitiveness. With his two brothers, he would draw at the kitchen table. He always wanted to win and usually did win, as his uh, brother John said, sadly, usually did win that Hershey bar, which was the prize. But also he was fascinated, he was brought up in the radio age. They didn't have a television. They got their first radio um, when Warhol was nine and he would sit enraptured, not just listening to plays of the day and the news, etc., but also listening to sounds on the radio, sounds of footsteps approaching or something like that. He was always fascinated by those other sounds that you could hear on the radio. And the other, of course, important thing was the cinema for Warhol. 
And there were two cinemas in Pittsburgh. And when he could save up or do little tasks to earn the money, he would go to the cinema with his older brothers. Wow. Um, now, you actually got the chance to meet and interview many members of his family. Uh, what can you tell us about Andy Warhol that we wouldn't uh, necessarily know? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? When I first started interviewing them in 1996, in fact, we knew much less about Warhol and his family, and indeed much less about his early career of drawing. The main thing that emerged, particularly from his middle brother, John, in fact, was how sensitive Andy was. But I mean sensitive in the fact that he never swore and also tried to avoid conflict. So he didn't get into fights. And that impressed his brother because at school, he said, there was always scrabbles and fights. And somehow he managed to manipulate his way out of it. But more than that, for his two brothers, and particularly for John, was this phenomena of a young boy who listened to people who appeared to be really fascinating fascinated by them. But also, when they got their house um, in Dawson Street, which had a garden, whereas John and Paul grew vegetables, he grew flowers and entered them for competitions, as did John entered his vegetables. Um, but other things, I think, fascinated John about him. He took a bar of soap and he carved it to make it look like a little ivory elephant. Um, John said he didn't know what happened to that. So John was particularly interesting to talk to, but also Paul Warhol. Paul had seven children. They would go to New York and visit Warhol when he moved there. In fact, particularly after his mother moved there in 1952. Mm -hmm. And they would go up there and go into this amazing townhouse. And the children would clamber up the Brillo boxes. But what they told me, Madeleine, etc the nieces and nephews, they told me that Warhol would kind of play tricks on them to please them. So rather than take them to the factory, he would pretend that Greta Garbo was phoning them or some wonderful film star and would let them talk to them on the telephone. Of course, they weren't there at all. It was somebody pretending to be them. But also he involved them in his art. He let them staple, particularly George, the nephew, let staple uh, things to canvases. He let them help draw things. So mm -hmm. he actually involved the children, kind of taught them about art. Well, when we think of Andy Warhol, we directly think of uh, pop art. But at one stage, he decided to work in cinema. Why was, it, why was that decision of his so controversial at the time? Well, he already had one very successful career as an illustrator, being when he stopped actually working in the illustration world in around 1961, he was already the highest paid illustrator in America. Then he makes a decision to become an artist and starts making the screen prints, of course, and the Campbell soup cans. But why suddenly cinema? Well, it made logical sense. He bought in 1963 a 16-millimeter uh, film camera and started to record things. The first film he made was Sleep, where he watched uh, John Giorno sleeping. Why did he do that? Well, if you think again back to his childhood, how he was brought up, watching those big screen, the screen with these close-ups of people on screen, close-ups of the stars, he was fascinating fascinated by people's faces, by the way they did ordinary things like eat or sleep. Now, what was controversial, of course, was he then decided to continue filmmaking, almost at some points, you know, promoting that over his art. And the films were, of course, controversial, as we know. Um, but also, he then, in 65, made Chelsea Girls, which actually was a commercial film in a sense that it was shown commercially. And Bridget mm -hmm. Berlin, one of his superstars who uh, was in it, said that her mother, who was this grand, uh, grand lady on the DAR, you know, Daughters of Revolution, goes and sees the film and is so horrified that her daughter would be involved in this filmmaking. But what a brave decision of a man to, again, change what he's doing, to try and break into something which he was pouring money into, actually, and not making money from. Exactly. Now, um, 
Warhol was a huge family guy, and uh, earlier you touched on uh, the fact that his mother influenced him and supported him a lot in his artwork. Tell me about the relationship uh, that they both had. I think Warhol's relation with his mother is essential in the understanding of Warhol. Not only did she protect and support him and recognize his talent, but also in 1952, she went to live with him in New York when her other two sons were married. And she became his first factory member. We hear a lot about Warhol's factory and how he, he, he worked with different people and got the best out of them. But he loved his mother's art. And from a child, he'd been fascinated how she turned things into not just the soup cans that she put flowers into, um, paper flowers and sold them and fashioned some of the cans into flowers, but also how she drew angels and cats and used things, napkins and things like that as the background, as collage. But she also had this wonderful flowery writing. So she would sign um, the work as Andy Warhol's signature, Andy Warhol in this lovely flowering script. And he recognized her talents and produced these books with her. But how clever of him, when he got work from places like Glamour magazine, he mm. would take um, these books and give them to people as gifts, which his mother had helped illustrate. Wow. Well, Jean, thank you so much for joining us today in remembering and paying tribute to the very magnificent Andy Warhol. Thank you so much.